the family of First Baptist Church, Indian Trail, welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Indian Trail. thankful today that there is a well that contains an unending supply of God's grace. Amen. That we can just keep coming back to no matter what life might throw at us. There is grace sufficient. I'm also glad to know today that as we journey through this thing called life, that even in those times where the way gets dark, we can know with great assurance because the word of God says so, that there's an unseen hand that is leading us and guiding us along this pathway of life. Leads 
If I were to ask you to just stand and give us a little recipe for success, I wonder what it would sound like coming from uh, this kind of crowd. I suspect that uh, a lot of people would probably say, well, success comes when you uh, have the right kind of degree that you could get plugged into the right kind of uh, career path. Uh, working for the right company, making the right kind of money, then getting hooked up with the right mate, having the right husband, having the right wife, and then uh, raising a couple of kids, living in uh, a particular house in a particular neighborhood with uh, maybe the 401k flourishing, you know, really, the fact of the matter is, guys, you can go to the best school in America and you can graduate with a degree that fits your skill set to the point that you get a great job making wonderful money, marry and have a great family, and still come to the end of the way and be a miserable failure. But because what we look at today as success is not God's recipe for success. Uh, last Sunday, we, we looked uh, at a transformed life. And uh, frankly, I got to reading those next few verses and I thought, wow, I can't leave this out. This is, this is just way too good to uh, ignore and to uh, maybe skip over. I want to talk to you this morning about really... Uh, God's recipe for success. And, and I want you to listen closely as Paul is writing to Timothy. Now, he's been giving Timothy some uh, particular instructions, maybe generalized, but now then he, he, he's zeroing in and he's getting uh, more detailed in his charge to his son in the ministry, Timothy. Timothy. And here today, beginning in chapter number one, 1 Timothy chapter one, and uh, we're going we're gonna to begin reading in the 18th verse, uh, chapter one, verse 18, and then we're going to finish the chapter 19 and 20. And so stand with me and, in the honor of the reading of the word of God. And uh, listen now as Paul begins his, his commitment to Timothy. 
notice what he says, this charge I commit unto you. Now, the word charge is a very powerful military term. Uh, boy, my CO was a uh, third grade uh, dropout. And uh, he picked himself up by his bootstraps and put himself through school as an adult and wound up being a captain uh, in a headquarters company out in Fort Hood, Texas. And when he would come in to my office and give me some instructions, uh, I knew, but it wasn't optional uh, because of the power behind his command. And, and this is exactly the term that uh, Paul is giving to Timothy. I, I charge you, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on you that uh, you by them might war a good warfare, holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, uh, whom I have delivered unto Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. Uh, let's just pray and, and then we'll get into the message. Father, um, I pray God that you would really burn this word into our heart and, and help us to realize God, what a meaningful, successful life really is, uh, is like. And help us to take these instructions seriously and put them into practice. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you. Uh, please be seated. Now, um, if you're serious uh, about wanting a successful life, I want you to spend a little bit of time today and write down this recipe that uh, Paul is giving to Timothy. And uh, I want you to know what the first one is. You ready? Be who you are in Christ. Now that sounds like double talk, but it's, it's really not. Notice what he says in verse 18. Uh, this charge I commit to you, Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on you. Uh, just pretty plain. And, and Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, be who you are in Christ. Timothy, don't you remember? Um, you read about this in chapter 4 of this same book. Uh, Paul says, Timothy, don't you remember that the elders came and they laid hands on you and they prophesied uh, over you? And, and Timothy, I want you to remember what they said about you and who you are and I want you to be who you are. Now, it does sound a little double talk. It's how can I be what I am when I am what I be? So there, there's, a little bit of, uh, there's a little bit of double talk in the midst of that. Uh, but apparently, uh, these men had prophesied over him and told him, remember what they said about you and spoke into your life. As you began your ministry, as you began uh, your uh, Christian life, remember who you are and live out what they said that you are. Now, in all likelihood, nobody's ever done that to you. Nobody's ever put you in a circle and uh, laid hands on you and prophesied over you and told you who you are. But may I say to you, God has said who you are. God has told you who you are. So let's find out what that is. What has God said about you? What has he revealed about you? And let's determine that before we leave this room today, that we're going to begin to live who we are in Christ. Now the first one is, thank God we are no longer condemned now, I suspect that you're like a lot of other people, and that is we forget what our life was like uh, B.C., before Christ, okay? Uh, we, we've forgotten uh, who we were before Jesus saved us. But now Romans 8 comes along, and verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Well, B.C., if you'll remember, if you'll think about it for a minute, you were under a curse. You were under condemnation. 
You were under the condemnation of the law. But then God opened up your eyes and he revealed to you himself and your sin and you turned away from sin, trusted Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior. All of a sudden, your sins were removed as far as the east was from the west and he removed that condemnation from your life. Filled you with the Holy Ghost. You're not the same anymore. There is therefore now no condemnation on our life. Now the second thing that God says about us, he says that you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood and you are a holy nation. Uh, you find that in 1 Peter chapter number 2, if you will. Now, you understand, and please do not repeat something that I did not say. But understand this, that the Jews are now no longer the only chosen people. For anyone, whether they are Jew or whether they are Gentile, when they turn to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God then says, you are a chosen people. You, you're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. No matter where you come from in life, we are chosen uh, by God. Now, what does that mean? That means that we matter. It means that we count. It means that we have significance in this life because now we are God's own chosen people and we've been brought out of darkness and put into the light. Now, number three, the Bible tells me, God says that I am more than a conqueror. In Romans chapter eight and verse 37, he says, I am more than a conqueror. Now, it's one thing to be a conqueror. It's another thing to be more than a conqueror. And because of that, ladies and gentlemen, we need to walk with our heads up high. Uh, because the battle, as you've heard sung already this morning, the battle has already been won. Now, uh, I was sitting there in, in a minute ago, and I was listening to them sing, sing that song, and, and I thought about uh, what you may be thinking about during that song. The, the, the battle is over and you're thinking, no, it's not either. If you knew what I was going through, you wouldn't be singing that song. Well, you understand there are still some skirmishes that we're going to have down here on this earth. But God's already won the victory. It, it's already, I love the book of Revelation. And, and I love the, really the movements in the book of Revelation. And what you watch is you see God's people up here and then you see them way down here and then you'll see them up here and you'll see them down here. You'll see them up, you'll see them down, up and down all the way through. But now listen what the Bible says. The Bible says ultimately the kingdoms of this world will be the kingdoms of our great God and God's people win. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, now hear my heart a minute. I know all of us at some point in time get down. Can I get a witness in the house? I mean, we all get down from time to time. But, but don't stay there. Don't stay there. God doesn't want you to stay there. When you get down and realize, well, I'm not where I need to be, then get up in the name of Jesus. And God wants us to bounce back and just say to the enemy, hey, I'm more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. So be who you are. Now, the fourth thing is you and I have been sanctified and justified. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I want you to turn over there with me, if you will, and let's, let's read that one together. 1 Corinthians chapter number 6, and uh, pick it up, if you will, in verse number 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. 
Now look as he begins to say, here are the people that are not going to make it into heaven. Here are the people that are not going to get saved. You ready? Now watch this. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, that is sex outside of marriage, nor idolaters, something in a person's life that is more important than God, has a higher place, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you are washed and you're sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the spirit of our God. Now I just got to think, what, what a church this Corinth church must have been. Now, if I were going to start a church, I certainly wouldn't name it Corinth Baptist Church um, because it was so carnal, it was unbelievable. But, but what an exciting church that must have been at one time or another. You, you go into that church, and, and over here in this corner uh, was a bunch of robbers and a bunch of thieves. Better hold on to your billfold just in case somebody reverted back, you know. So over here was a bunch of robbers and a bunch of thieves. Over there in that corner was a bunch of prostitutes uh, that had gotten saved. O over here was a bunch of extortioners that had gotten saved. Over here was a bunch of people that had some kind of sexual immorality about their life and homosexuals and prostitutes that had been set free from their perversion. And they were over there in there. And you could just see when you walked into that building that day that here's a bunch of people that were lost as last year's Easter egg and now God has changed them and saved their old wretched soul. What an exciting place that must have been. Here they were. And then verse 11 says, and such were some of you. Mm, mm. That God had come along and set free by the, his own grace. That, that's exciting to me. Um, I get invited to a lot of places to preach once. And, and, and I'll get in there. <laughs> and um, I, I'm kind of like the... Uh, I'm kind of like the, uh, the cross-eyed disc thrower. Hmm? May not score a lot of points, but he keeps the crowd awake. Do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> now, that's the kind of church uh, that this church was. It was an exciting place. They didn't go to sleep. But such were some of you. What a testimony this is of the power of God to change people's lives. Now, I know this to be true because I are one. We're not perfect, right? We, we, uh, we know Jesus. Uh, we, we're, we're on our way to heaven. But what happens when we're going through this journey and all of a sudden we, we say something that we ought not to say? or we do something that we ought not to do. In other words, we just blow it, right? Can I get a witness from anybody around here that knows what I'm talking about? When you blow it, what happens? There's, there's something that gets right there on your shoulder and starts whispering in your ear and sometimes shouting, look what you did. Look what you said. Why? You're not saved. You're not a Christian. No way you're going to go to heaven. Not when you're doing that kind of stuff and living that kind of life. You see, when that happens, you just need to stand up and say, I've been sanctified. I've been justified. 
God has removed my sin as far as the east is from the west and I'm on my way to glory, leave me alone. Now, there's another word in here that I think God chooses for us, that we are overcomers. First uh, John chapter five, and probably good for you maybe just to see that um, and underline it or so hold on to it till you get ready to have it one of these days. In chapter five and verse number four, uh, he says, for whatsoever or whosoever, are y'all listening? Say amen. amen. For whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. That's good stuff. I like that term, overcomer. Now, may I say to you, you and I are the only people in all of the earth uh, that God has given that promise to of great victory. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, I've had people, you've had people, you know them, you've heard them say it. Well, I've got this addiction. Uh, I, I've got this oppression. And, and you know, I just can't do anything about it. <clears throat> Wrong. What does God say? God says, the day that I came into your heart and your life, saved your soul, forgave you of your sins, took up residence there, you then became an overcomer of the things in this world. And you can do all things through Christ. Paul says, if you want to live a successful life, then live out daily the life of who you are. You're no longer condemned. Shout about it. You are washed and sanctified and justified. Rehearse it, confess it over and over again. You're an overcomer in this world. Then live like it. So be who you are, okay? Number two, you ready for this one? Fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. Notice what uh, he says now I'm back in 1 Timothy again. And uh, he says in verse, the latter part of verse 18, he says uh, that you by them might war a good warfare or fight a good fight. Now, I grew up over in the mountains of western North Carolina, as all of you know. You know, we, we had dirt roads. Uh, they piped in sunshine back in there. It, I mean, we were way up on top of this m mountain in a what's called a saddle, which is uh, the, the, the land between two mountains. And we were there in that saddle. We, we were pretty much self-contained. We pretty much had everything there that we would ever need. But uh, when, when I grew up, I, I loved to fight. Now, I was a scrawny kid. Now, I won't tell you, I had to run around in the rain to get wet. It was amazing. My little skinny, scrawny legs, I still have scrawny legs, but, but, but I love to fight. And, and we would just, my cousins and I, we'd just fight for the fun of it. I, I, we'd get out in a briar patch and just go at it. We, we'd put on, we, sometimes we'd put on gloves, sometimes we, we'd just fight and we'd wrestle. And I, I, I mean, we didn't know any better. It's just part of the deal, you know, and I loved it. When I was about 12 years old, we moved to South Carolina. Totally different culture altogether. Just, I mean, I, it, was, it, it was really traumatic. And, and I had to, I, I said, you know what? I'm, I'm not going to fight anymore. Uh, and I really, from the time I was 12 years old, I did everything I possibly could just to avoid it. Just to stay away. I just, uh, somebody would really have to back me into a corner and I didn't see any way other way. That'd be about the only way that, but I'd, I'd do that. But I just determined I was going to quit that fighting. But God says, fight the good fight. Now, where are we supposed to be fighting? Now, I get frustrated, y'all. I, I really do of this little namby-pamby 
wasted kind of approach that people have about Christianity today. And, and, and we've got a, a sissified, um, if I could say that, was that a word? We have a little sissified approach to Christianity today. And, and we're telling people after they get saved, you know, I, I want you just to get over here in this posture of docility and get over here into this posture of passivity and you just kind of let the world go by and you get into your little holy huddles and just pretend that everything is all right. But you know what? Paul, Paul said to Timothy, I want you to endure as a good soldier. And the day that you got saved, you became a soldier in the army of the Lord. And this is not a playground that we find ourselves in now. It's a battleground and you better learn how to fight the good fight. And I am convinced that the reason today we have so many people that are vacating the church, that are leaving the church, uh, that don't see the relevance of the church is because they have never learned how to fight the fight. Now, let's look at this thing for just a minute. What are you talking about? Who are we supposed to be fighting against? Okay, you ready? First of all, we are to be fighting against the deeds of darkness. In, in Ephesians chapter 5 and uh, verse number 11, uh, Paul says to the church uh, there, he says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. In other words, expose the fruits of darkness. Expose darkness. Turn the light on in darkness. But may I say to you, when you start exposing darkness, dude, you've got a fight on your hands. You've got a fight on your hands. When we stand up to this culture, when we buck the trends of the wind that is blowing in our society, when we start bringing purity and decency and holiness to the forefront in whatever arena that might be, whether it's a political arena, an educational arena, or a spiritual arena, uh, you're going to have a fight on your hands. But the Bible says we are to turn the light on darkness. Now, the second is we fight against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness that's in the air. Um, Ephesians chapter 6, we wrestle not uh, against flesh and blood. You know, I, I, really didn't, I, I really didn't probably deal with this uh, at 9.30 and, and, and at 8 o'clock like I ought to deal with it. I want to speak to you husbands and wives here just a minute. This, this is not a message on the home. But, but I want to tell you what, when we're seeing the divorce as rampant as it is and we're seeing separations of couples uh, like we are seeing inside and outside the church, it's really obvious that these husbands and wives really don't understand that this is not a flesh and blood problem. This is a problem of spiritual wickedness and principalities and demonic activity that Paul says is in the air that is going to come against you to defeat you. And you husbands and wives, you need to get off of this thing of looking at what that other person is not bringing into the relationship and the faults and the failures of the person that you committed your life life to and get your focus of attention on where the real battle is coming from and that's from a very sinister force of evil that is surrounding your life and start doing battle where the real battle is. By the way, this stuff doesn't just happen. Every Bible-believing church in the country, every Bible-believing individual in the country is going to be faced uh, with this kind of demonic activity. Paul said it's in the air and we need to fight it. How do you do it? You do it with the only tool that God has given to us. By the way, you know that I'm a political person. I, I try to stay informed and I, I, I try to know who those candidates are. And I encourage us to, to stay with candidates that are, that are going to stick uh, to the word of God. But hear my heart a minute. 
The battle that you and I are fighting in against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness is not going to be won at the ballot box. It will only be won in prevailing prayer down on our knees and seeking God on behalf of what's going on in our land. Now, <clears throat> there's a, another battleground, and it's called the sinful nature. The sinful nature. Here's the passage that, that God's been using almost daily in my life for the last two weeks. And it's Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. And the Bible tells us there that if we will continually walk in the Spirit, then we will not gratify the lusts of the flesh. But if you fail to walk in the Spirit, you're going to mess up just as sure as the world and give in to the temptation of that lust of the flesh that bombards us. Now, it'll keep you from doing the will of God. I can promise you that. You, you, you cannot, hear my heart, children of God, hear me a minute. You cannot saunter through this life thinking, well, you know, it's, you know, things are kind of tough and things are kind of bad. But you know what? I, I'm just going to let God take care of it. May I say to you, you're going to miserably fail with that kind of spirit, with that kind of attitude. That kind of disposition is not going to help you be a successful person of God. Uh, we're, we're in a battle. The Bible says that we are to fight against this sinful nature all the way to the end. You, you understand, you may be saved, but we have not been glorified yet. And, and you're still living in this body. I am simply amazed and alarmed at, at all of the activity that I have seen in these recent years of these incredible addictions that people have fallen susceptible to. And oftentimes and most times, they are demonic uh, addictions. And we're seeing a manifestation of these in our culture and really a manifestation of them inside the church. And the church has become a victim. And the reason that the church has become a victim is because the church hasn't learned how to fight against the sinful nature. We still want to do it with human means. But the Bible says that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of these strong ones. Okay, let, let me give you another one. You ready? It's the battle of the world's system. The world's system. James 4 says, you cannot be a friend to the world because if you're a friend to the world, then you are an enemy with God. If you are in the world and love the world, then the love of the Father is not in you. Now, when we talk about the world here, we're not talking about grass and trees and water and, 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 and mountains and valleys and oceans. We're not talking about that at all. But we are talking about a system. We are talking about a philosophy that is really a system and philosophy that is anti-God. Secular humanism, ladies and gentlemen, don't buy into that. But I'm watching Christians today buy into the world system of finances. I'm watching Christians today buy into the system of morality. I'm watching and listening as Christians today are buying in to the values of our culture. You understand, it's one thing uh, for a boat to be in the water. It's another for the water to be in the boat. It's one thing for the church to be in the world. It's another for the world to get inside the church. By the way, there are not many prophets that are preaching that gospel today. Th then we're fighting against the devil himself. In James chapter 4 and also 
in First Peter, you find the words that, uh, you know, you got to be careful of the devil because he's like a roaring lion going to and fro all of the earth, seeking whom he may, what? Devour. That, that, that's the devil himself. But, the, but he goes on to tell us that we are to resist the devil. Do you know, have you learned yet? The devil is a coward. Have you learned that? He's a coward. And you as a child of God have every right and every authority to stand in front of the devil and say to the devil, I am a blood washed, born again, child of God, filled with the spirit of God. You have no rights or authority over me. Get away from me. And the Bible says that he has to flee. Uh, I, I had a little battle with him this week. I did. I was going to a North Greenville University board meeting and got over there in Gaffney on highway number 11, was going in that back way. And I got behind him on number 11 going 10, <clears throat> going 10 miles an hour slower than the speed limit would allow. And I stayed back there a minute. I thought, this is, this is not good. And I, I just peeled around and went on by him. And well, she, she came in behind me, sped up while I was trying to pass and got in right behind me and just showered down on the horn. And I'm thinking, what in the world are you doing? Why are you doing that? We go on into a little old town there on number 11. I get to the red light. Had to stop and she pulled in right in behind me, man. Got right on my bumper. And as soon as that red light turned green, she blew down on I was so glad I was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. I really, it didn't hurt that my 18 year old granddaughter was sitting beside me too, you know. You see, the devil will come back and he will tempt you to get back into those old addictions, back into that obsession, back into that bondage. And at that point, you've got to, in no uncertain terms, speak to the devil in the name of Jesus, in the shed blood and by the power of his name and say, leave me alone. You're an overcomer. I got to close with this. I wish I had time to develop all of it. I, I evidently just in preparation got a little carried away, but the third ingredient is this. You ready? Hold on to the essentials. Now look at verses 19 and 20. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not uh, to blaspheme. Now, the Corinthian church had, uh, they had some unruly members. Alexander, Hymenaeus, don't know exactly what they did. There is some strong indications that maybe they were teaching false doctrine in the church. And so the apostle said we had to kick them out. We had, we had to exercise church discipline and we had to expel them from the church, not vindictively, not vengefully, but prayerfully that they could see the error of their ways and repent of their sins and be restored back into the fellowship. So they had to do that. And then he goes on to tell Timothy, he said, Timothy, there are two things now uh, I want to tell you before I go on to something else. He says, first of all, he says, I want you to hold on to faith. Want to be successful? Hold on to faith. We're saved by faith. We're kept by faith, sustained by faith. We live by faith. You, you see, Jesus placed a high premium on faith. When the disciples couldn't cast out that demon, they came frustrated and Jesus just said, oh, ye of little faith. Placed a high premium on faith. We, we ought to live our life knowing that God is a sovereign God 
that he is in control of our life. When we go out on a date on Friday night or Saturday night, we go to that restaurant, we need to know that God's on the throne and that's the table that he wants us to sit at that night. And we sit there at that table and Mary Lou comes up to wait on us and she's our waitress. She's the one God sent to us that night. And then there's little Billy, he's our bus boy. And, 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 and we're living by faith that he is there for us and we're there for him. And then when we check out at the counter, we're living by faith knowing that God sent us on that way, on that journey. Every day of our life ought to be lived in faith. And then he says an amazing thing. He says, keep a good, clear conscience. Wiersbe said that a clear conscience or a conscience, if you uh, will, um, is um, that inner voice that's saying to you, somebody is watching. It's that indicator in us. By, by the way, did you know that Lost people have a conscience and, and believers have a conscience. And it's that inner indicator to us that tells us that we are uh, getting into some dangerous territories, that we need to be careful about that. But, but keep a good, clear conscience. Paul, Paul right here, I, I believe, is pleading with Timothy with an old worn out word that, that we are using way too much today, but it's still transfers great understanding. He says, Timothy, make sure that you're living a life of transparency and genuineness and honesty. God's people of all of the people in the world that needs to be said of them. C could I ask you if you just unzipped your life for a minute, if, if you just unzipped your soul and, and showed everybody what was on the inside, would you have some stuff on the inside today that you'd be ashamed of and you wish that nobody knew about? Some impurity, some dishonesty, some sinfulness that you know, I, I've yielded about everything. Everybody thinks that I've got my whole life together and I've yielded everything to God, but th there's just a certain element here of my life that I'm still holding on to that I don't want anybody to know about and I, I, I haven't let go yet and God's not sovereign over right now. Edgar Guest wrote a poem many years ago called Myself. I, I, I want you to listen to it carefully. I have to live with myself and so I want to be fit for myself to know. I, I want to be able as days go by always to look myself straight in the eye. I, I don't want to stand with the setting sun and hate myself for the things I have done. I don't want to keep on a closet shelf a lot of secrets about myself and fool myself as I come and go into thinking no one else will ever know the kind of person I really am. I don't want to dress up myself in sham. I don't want to go out with my head erect and want to deserve all men's respect. But here in the struggle for fame and wealth, I want to be able to like myself. I don't want to look at myself and know that I'm a bluster and bluff and empty show. I can never hide myself from me. I see what others may never see. I know what others may never know. I never can fool myself and so... Whatever happens, I want to be self-respecting and conscience-free. Well, a recipe for success. I think it's time that God's people begin to live who they are. That's right. That's right. It is way past time that God's people Fight the good fight. And it's time we hold on to the essentials. Holding on to faith. And making sure that we have a good conscience with men and with God. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Father, 
I want to just say thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for your word. I, I, I thank you, Lord, that it is quick and powerful. Thank you for the conviction that it brings. God, I pray that a lot of people this morning have been impacted for eternity with your word. Lord, for that man or woman that's here today that's lost and on their way to hell, I pray that you would save them. They're still under condemnation. They're still under the wrath. They're still under curse. And God, you intend to save their soul. God, I pray that today they would say yes to you. And Lord, for those that may be here today that really struggling with being an overcomer and walking in victory and in power and strength and doing battle with the enemy. And they're, they're battling with people rather than where the real struggles are. God, I pray that you would really enlighten them to this truth and, and help them, Lord, to say, oh, that's why that I keep messing up. That's why I keep failing. That's why things are so divisive. And then, Lord, I just I, I pray that every one of us would learn what more it is to walk by faith and not by sight. Lord, you said that unless we learned how to do that, we could never please you. God, for all of us who have some things zipped up, that we don't want anybody else to know about and see. You see it, you know it, and one day it is gonna come to light. So help us to humble ourselves before you have to. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.